and welcome to this lecture on distribution fitting. You might recall from past lectures that if we wanted to get an idea of our data, we would just eyeball our histogram. We would see if it looked like one of the known distributions and then we would go on and we would measure the key parameters for that distribution. So if our data looked like a normal distribution, we would calculate the mean and standard deviation. For a uniform distribution, we would calculate the min and max. And for an exponential distribution, we would calculate the rate parameter. This week, we're going to look a little bit more formally at distribution fitting, and we're going to introduce what is called a goodness of fit test, which is pretty much a um, special case of a hypothesis test, which we've done in previous weeks as well. And later we will look at bootstrapping to find the distribution parameters. Now, in order to illustrate this, we made a data set available and you can get the link on GitHub down below in the description where all of our lecture data is provided. And the specific data set that we're looking at for this week talks about or gives us some data about the orders um, that we can expect per day for a company. And if we draw a histogram of this orders per day variable of ours, then we get something that looks like this. Now, it doesn't look like a bell-shaped curve. It definitely doesn't look like an exponential distribution. So we may think, all right, maybe this follows a uniform distribution. And we can co uh, carry on and we can calculate the minimum value, which in this case is 142, and we can calculate the maximum value, which is 257. Now, <clears throat> the total number of observations um, is nothing other than the length of this um, orders per day vector of ours, and that would be uh, 120 observations. You may recall that the histogram had six bins in total, and each of those bins were about 20 um, orders per day wide. If the data, our orders per day, was perfectly uniformly distributed, then how many observations do you think out of those 120 would actually be in each one of our six bins? Right? You're correct. We just take our total number of observations, they should be equally distributed, so we can expect exactly 20 observations in each one of the bins. Right, so if our orders per day came from a perfect or perfectly followed a uniform distribution, this is what we should actually get. But this is what we do have. And the red line shows you what we should have actually gotten if it was following the uniform distribution perfectly. So we see that although we expected um, 20 observations in the bin between 140 and 160, we actually only observed 19. Between 160 and 180, we expected 20, but we got 200, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 25 observations. Now, <clears throat> the logic behind fitting distributions is that after we kind of just view our data and we assume that this random variable of ours actually follows a specific distribution. And we state that as our null hypothesis. The variable, our variable, our observations follow this assumed distribution. And the alternative hypothesis is that the variable does not follow this specific distribution. Now, the question then becomes is, do we have sufficient evidence against the null hypothesis? Can we prove beyond reasonable doubt that the null hypothesis is actually wrong? Now, is this correct? Why not do the following and say that the null hypothesis is that the variable does not follow the specific distribution and the alternative hypothesis states that the variable follows the distribution? And the answer is that the burden of proof is too high and then we may never be able to reject the null hypothesis. All right, there's a typo. That should be H0 that we're rejecting. 
Now, many distributions have quite similar shapes and often fitting any of them is good enough um, for our planning purposes. So at least what we want to do is we want to be able to eliminate distributions that clearly do not um, belong and that will really give us bad results. So this may actually be good enough for our purposes. So in order to perform the hypothesis test, we need to calculate the p-value. And for that, we need two things. We need what we call the chi-squared value, spelled C-H-I, and we also need the degrees of freedom, and then we can calculate the p-value. All right, so what is this chi-squared value? Well, it is the sum, essentially, of the squares of n independent standard normal random variables. What do we mean with that? If we have a look at what this z squared actually means, you may recognize it from, from past hypothesis tests that we've done. We look at each bin, we sum over all of our bins from 1 to, uh, to n, and for, e for each bin we actually say, what was the bin count that we've observed? Minus, what was the bin count that we expected? We take the square of that and we divide it by the actual, sorry, by the expected bin count for that particular bin. And that's why we say it is the sum of the squares of n independent standard normal random variables. We can do this by hand, but it's much quicker to do this in R. Um, and we can calculate in this particular case that the chi square value is 3.2 for our orders per day variable. Now the degrees of freedom is the number of bins in this case, not the number of observations, but the number of bins, which is 6 minus 1, and then we get the degrees of freedom is 5. And then we can calculate the p-value to be 0 0.669. And we do that using the R script. And what this essentially does, and I'll show you the graph just now, is that we calculate what is the chance that we've seen such a large difference between the bin counts or more. The p-value we interpret in exactly the same way. The conclusion is we do not reject the null hypothesis because there's not sufficient evidence to say that the variable does not follow our uniform distribution. Right, so we interpret this p-value as the probability of having observed the differences in bin counts that we've observed while the data actually follows this uniform distribution that we've estimated, that probability is 66.9%. So it's a pretty high likelihood. If it was over um, anything over 5 or 10%, depending on what your alpha value is, if it is greater than that, you cannot reject the null hypothesis. Anything smaller than, let's say, uh, 0.05, and you can reject the null hypothesis. So this is what the guy square distribution actually looks like. When we calculate the p-value, we are actually saying, and you'll note that I've kind of um, plotted the discrete values, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., because that's what we do with bin counts. They are an observation is either in a bin or it isn't. So while the chi-square distribution is a continuous distribution, when we calculate the chi-square value, we're looking specifically at the exact bin counts. So our value 3.2 states that what is the chance, and we calculate the probability, which is the area below the curve, to the right-hand side. What is the chance that our chi-square value, which is the difference between the bin counts and what we've actually expect under the perfect distribution of the normal, uh, sorry, of the null hypothesis and that value or larger. That is what we're calculating below the curve. So in this case, you see it's a fairly large proportion. To be exact, it is 66.9% and therefore we cannot reject the null hypothesis. Let's just demonstrate how you would go about using this data, doing this in R. In R Studio, I've already created a new project. 
I'm now creating a new script file, which I will use to demonstrate the chi-square test. As always, I like starting with a clean workspace and I'm calling the necessary libraries. Let's just save this file and call it example.r. To read the data, in a previous video, we've actually demonstrated and showed you how to read in the data from GitHub, which is a repository that we've created for this module's um, lecture data. And you will see, and yours might look different at the time when you actually watch this video, that inside the data folder, there's some subfolders for different weeks and tests. And then you will get, in week 10, you should get the orders per day file. It is a CSV file, and if we click on this file, we can actually see its contents as GitHub displaying it to us. Now, in the other video, the file was, I cannot remember, compressed or it was too large to view online. And we showed a different way to actually get the URL. But in this particular case, you can click on raw. It will show you the data in its original unformatted form. And we are interested in that URL there at the top. So I'm just going to copy that URL. And in our studio, I can read the file, and instead of the file name, I can just paste that URL. I'm going to just provide the two column types, and I've seen online that both of them are integer. So I can just read this in, and it reads it directly from the GitHub repository. And there's the data that I've just read in. Alternatively, we can clean our workspace. We can also read in the orders from file. And in my case, I saved the data relative to my R script, and I have it as already saved it as orders per day. And again, I read in the data, and it looks exactly the same. All right. <clears throat> the data that we're going to look at here might look slightly different from what we've recorded in the video, and that is simply because we sometimes use different random seeds to generate the data. But here we see that the minimum value is 140 and the maximum is 260, but we still have our 120 observations. We can draw a histogram. Of our data and you if you do get an error to say that the figure margins aren't too low it might just be because I've zoomed in in this case just so that you can see better so I'm just going to zoom out a little bit and then if I draw the histogram here you will see that I can actually see the observations it varies between 140 and 260 Or I can plot it with the label values in terms of the bin counts. And now I see the values that we've observed in, in the lecture as well. I can assign this histogram command to a variable, let's call it h. And here in my data, let me just expand this again, you can see that h contains the breaks the counts, the densities, the mid-value of the breaks, and some other attributes. So the number of bins is simply, if I take my H value, the number of counts. Remember, the breaks will always be one more because there's a break on either side of a bin. So the number of bins in this case is six. My actual bin counts is the counts, and I get 
19, 25, 20, 18, 15, and 23. Now I'm interested in calculating the difference between this actual values and what I expected. So what did I expect? It's my number of observations of orders, which is 120, divided by the number of bins. So I expected to actually have 20 observations in each one of my bins. Right, so if I want to manually calculate chi squared, I will calculate the sum over a whole bunch of things. And the bunch of things is actually the actual value, which in this case are six values, but we can do this in R, minus the expected value, all of the squared, divided by the expected value. And I want to take the sum over all of these. So actual is six values, but R will treat them one at a time. Expected is a scalar value, so it will always use the value 20. It'll take the difference and it will divide by the expected value. So if I just want to execute and see what happens here in the in that specific portion, I can select it and just execute that specific value. And then I see that I get six different values. I get one, which is 19 minus 20, which is minus one. And if I take the square of that, I get one. And then for the second value, I take 25 minus 20, which is five. And I take the square of that, then I get the 25. The next one is 20, so the difference is 0, squared is still 0. And then I've got 18 minus 20, which is 2, square it, and I get 4, etc. So I get the differences, I take the square of those differences, and I divide by 25, and I sum over all of them. And if I execute this entire line, you see that I've calculated my chi-squared value as 3.2. Next, I'm going to calculate my degrees of freedom, which is my number of bins minus one. And now I have to calculate my p-value. And there is already a known chi-square distribution in R, so like the normal distribution, the uniform and the exponential distributions, I have this p-function p chi square, which is the density distribution function, or the quantile or the random generation function. The p specifically is for the um, distribution function, the cumulative distribution function. So that's the one that I'm interested in. For the quantile value of this distribution, I'm going to use my chi squared value, which is 3.2. My degrees of freedom is this variable df. And we said we're not using the lower tail because we want to calculate what is the probability that we will get, a v um, that we would have observed at least the sky square value or more. And when I calculate my p value, I get the 0 0.6691829. So how do we go about repeating the test with other distributions? Now, the requirement for the chi-square test is that we need to compare the actual bin counts for a frequency diagram that we get against the expected bin counts for the distribution that we actually want to check. So with the chi-square dot test function, we just need the probability of an observation falling within that particular bin. Finding the actual bin counts is easy in R. You just come up with a histogram. And note that when you call the histogram function, it actually 
can give you back an entire object. And this histogram has a couple of internal variables. One of them is the counts. Another one is the breaks. Another one is the mid values of each one of your bins. So have a look at the histogram. Um, and you will also note that sometimes we ask you in a question to say, check whether this distribution actually fit, uh, fits. We ask you to use a specific number of breaks or a specific number of bins. And for that, you will just need to pass that as an additional argument to your histogram function. Finding the probability for bins for the uniform distribution is actually then quite easy. We use the diff function, which just calculates the differences between values. And what are we calculating the differences of? Well, internally, we then pass the p unit function, which is the cumulative density function for, for the uniform distribution. And for what values do we want to calculate these cumulative probabilities? Well, for each one of the breaks. And whatever your distribution then is in the uniform, we need to pass for the p unif function, we need to pass the parameters for a uniform distribution function, which is the minimum and the maximum values. But what if we have other distributions? Let's just take a quick break and show how this is done in R step by step. I'm interested in my breaks object, which I get from my histogram. It has a breaks variable. And I see that the breaks are from 140 in steps of 20 to 260. Now to calculate the null probabilities, I'm going to use the p unit function, the cumulative distribution function, and for my quantiles, I'm going to pass my breaks and I am giving my uniform distribution parameters under my null hypothesis. The minimum is the calculated minimum. And the maximum argument is the maximum of my daily orders. And when I execute this line, I get seven values, one for each of my break points. At the first break point at 140, the cumulative value says that there is a 0% chance that every, any points will, will fall at that value or lower because this is in fact the minimum value. At the second breakpoint, I expect that 16.67% of all my points will be at that breakpoint or lower. At my third breakpoint, I expect 33.3% of all my points to be at that breakpoint or lower. Now, what I'm actually interested in is only the points within that particular bin. So if I put this within the diff function, it will take all of the consecutive points in this first expression that I've executed. So it will calculate between the first and the second breakpoints cumulative uh, function. It will calculate the value and then between the second and the third breakpoint and then between the third and the fourth breakpoint, etc. So when I execute this, I actually get the percentage of points that own or the proportion of points that fall within that particular bracket or between those two breakpoints. And you will see that I have one less value in this, this command than what I had when I only called the p unit function because the diff function calculates the differences between consecutive values. And this I can now assigned to my null props and this will give me then the probabilities of points falling within a specific bin given the estimated or the assumed distribution under the null hypothesis. It turns out that there's kind of a general pattern here. So for any of your distributions you can rely on the following form of code typically. You first draw your histograms with or without the additional argument breaks, which we sometimes may, may give you. And then in that histogram object, you will then take the counts values. You will calculate the null probabilities to actually say, but what would the probability of a point be 
for that particular distribution. So we use the diff function. Um, but just note that pdist here is the distribution. There's no function in R called pdist. Um, we just use this as a placeholder for whatever the distribution is. So if it's uniform, it will be p unif. If it's an exponential distribution, it'll be p exp, etc. And the same with parameters. Every distribution that you then use will have its own parameters. And then we perform the chi-square test, which is a nice function in R that we can actually use, called chi-square dot test. And it takes three arguments that we typically provide. We give it our counts, which is the parameter x. There's a parameter p, which is the null um, probabilities, which is the probability of a point falling inside a bin for the distribution um, that, we, that we consider as our kind of null hypothesis. And then we just use a rescale p value equals true as an, as an argument um, to make sure that if our p values don't add up to one, we just rescale them to be between zero and one. So under the uniform distribution, if we apply this, this form, we draw the histogram, we calculate the null probabilities, which is the difference between, and you can do this in multiple steps to first check what does p unif actually give you. Um, <clears throat> we calculate the differences between the cumulative probabilities. And when we calculate the differences, it means we actually just get the actual probability inside that particular bin. So for the uniform distribution, we will calculate the differences between the cumulative probabilities for a uniform distribution, we provide the points at which we want the, the probabilities, the, the breaks of our histogram, and then we provide the, the, the distribution parameters as arguments, and we calculate the chi-square test. In R, this will result in a, a response that tells us that the, the chi-square value is 3.2. It'll pick up that the degrees of freedom is five because it knows how many breaks or values we've actually given it under X. And it gives us our p-value, which we've calculated manually earlier. So that says that this is a pretty good fit. We don't have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis that our data, our observations, our bin counts actually follows the red line which is the perfect uniform distribution with those given parameters. Now, if we want to conduct the chi-square test for the normal distribution, we would follow the same pattern. But now, after we've calculated the histogram, we calculate our null probabilities as the difference between um, cumulative probability values, but now we use p-norm. Still the same breaks, but now we give the parameters for a normal distribution, which is mean and standard deviation. And when we now call the chi-square test, with the, same with the same arguments, we actually get back that the chi-square value is now 32.936, which is much higher. And the probability that we would have observed our bin counts, if indeed the underlying distribution was normally distributed, is 0.05%. So much, much lower and much lower than alpha. So if this is what we've observed, the probability that these values actually come out of this distribution is very low. And then we can reject the null hypothesis that our data actually follows the normal distribution and we can accept the alternative which is our data does not follow this particular normal distribution. We can also conduct the chi-squared test and test for a Poisson distribution. Same process, we calculate a histogram, we, do the, we, we get our null uh, probabilities as the difference between the cumulative probability values which we get from the function p poise because now we're working with a Poisson distribution. And the Poisson distribution has a lambda argument um, which is simply the mean of, of our data. And we've covered this in earlier um, lectures in terms of the Poisson distribution. Now, if we call the chi-square test value, we get a p-value which is much, much smaller than 2.2 times e to the power of minus 16, which is approaching zero. Uh, 
And what this means is that if this is what we've observed in terms of bin counts, the probability that these observations of ours actually come from this distribution is nearly zero. And therefore, again, if our null hypothesis was that our data follows this Poisson distribution, and the alternative is it does not follow the Poisson distribution, with such a, a small p-value, we can clearly, it's much smaller than alpha, we can reject the null hypothesis and say, nope, our data does not follow this distribution. So, the goodness of its summary. With a chi-square test, we can evaluate and at least eliminate those distributions that are clearly not appropriate. To do so, we first draw a histogram to determine the bin counts, and we can specify to the hist um, function in R how many breaks do we actually want, or exactly what those breaks should be. And you will see in the test, we often tell you to use a specific number of breaks. And then we generate the expected bin counts, or the probabilities, using whatever this evaluated distribution is that we want to check in our null, in our hypothesis. Um, we provide it that specific distribution's parameters, and we compare the bin counts of what we've observed versus this expected probabilities of the tested distribution. Now, note that many distributions can actually give you a p-value which is greater than alpha. But be careful, a larger value of p does not mean that it is a better fit. When we calculate the p-value, all we're doing is either rejecting or not rejecting the null hypothesis. And that's it. Please do not interpret the p-value that a higher p-value suggests a better fit. If there are multiple plausible fits to the data analysis, the recommendation is always use all of them for whatever analysis it is that you want to do and actually see how it influences your output.